Well, Ken, you've certainly spent a number of years uh, on these questions. I'm talking with Dr. Kenneth Ring. We're in the Prague Botanical Gardens. Dr. Ring is the author of The Omega Project and is the world's leading expert on the near-death experience. Ken, I know recently you've been interested in UFOs. How did you get from UFOs or from near-death experiences to UFOs? That seems quite a leap. Well, on one perhaps mistaken day, I picked up a copy of Whitley Strieber's book, uh, Communion, came out some years ago. And though I had no interest in, in fact, an aversion to UFO studies, I found that some of those effects that he was talking about of those experiences seemed very reminiscent of those that followed NDEs, and so I wanted to explore the connection. Why do you think that these abduction phenomena never happen to what I would call smart people? In other words, it's always some poor soul who lives in a trailer park. Mm, no, I don't happen. think so. I think that uh, there are people who have these experiences that come from a pretty wide uh, swath of the social register up and down. What I found uh, in my studies is that actually the people who are prone to these experiences are folks with a troubled background. They, have, they often report uh, traumatic childhoods. They report sexual abuse, uh, stressful childhoods. There are people who, even as children, seem to be susceptible not to fantasy, but to alternate realities. Uh -huh. uh, that, they're, not everybody is equally likely to have this kind of experience. I don't think these folks are pathological or come from some particular social stratum, but they have particular kinds of psychological characteristics that predispose them to have these kinds of experiences. How do you relate this phenomenon to your own field of expertise, which is the near-death experience? What I found is the, if you look at the phenomena themselves, they seem extremely different in terms of their feature uh, surfaces. They're, or they're, 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 what, you look at the near-death experience, it's a very blissful experience, it's very beautiful, people have very many positive things to say about it. You look at the abduction experience, people are traumatized by it, deeply frightened, disturbed by it. They seem at antipodes, but if you look at the structure of these experiences, they, they, the structure is the same. They have the structure of shamanic journeys, of initiations. You're taken from the ordinary world, you're taken to another world, you learn things, you are transformed in that world, and you bring back those transformations transformations with you. What I found was that the same kind of background that's typical for people that report UFO encounters, not limited to but including abductions, is exactly the same kind of profile that you find for people that have had NDEs, near-death experiences. Same kind of person is prone to them, so I talk about an encounter-prone personality who's susceptible or vulnerable to these kinds of experiences more than the average person. But the key thing that relates these two phenomena, and perhaps others like them, are the transformations that tend to take place in the lives of people afterward. People with both kinds of experiences say afterward they're more appreciative of life, more appreciative of nature, they, are, they have a deeper feeling of self-worth, they are more compassionate individuals or less materialistic, they're more spiritual and not necessarily uh, more religious, in fact they may be less religious, but they're more spiritual, they're more psychic, they're more intuitive. It, what seems to be the outcome of these experiences is however, the ex how di however different the experiences themselves may be in their content, the effect is the same. You go through an ordeal of either nearly dying or the shock of a UFO encounter, and you're changed by that experience. Like Nietzsche said, that which doesn't kill me makes me stronger. These people are stronger spiritually. They seem to function at higher levels of, of intuitive understanding, of psychic awareness. It's an expanding experience for both. Well, is there, it, it's, it's interesting that the personality profile is the same, but in one case the reaction is positive, the other negative. Do people have near-death experiences without coming near to death? Sure, there, there are lots of ways. and I think the near-death experience is misleading because it implies there's something unique that happens at the point of physical death or when people enter clinical death, and that's not true. There are many different pathways that lead to essentially the same experiences without having to throw yourself under the tires of the nearest oncoming truck. Many different ways to get into this kind of experience. So relate it a little bit uh, to the psychedelic experience. I'd be happy to. Uh, I think that 
I've talked with a lot of people, I'm sure you've talked to many more, who have had high-dose LSD sessions or other kinds of psychedelic sessions who have told me, in effect, well, I never came close to death, but I know exactly what you mean when you talk about a near-death experience because I've had the same thing. The out-of-body experience, the feeling of moving into a beautiful, radiant, illuminated space, the sense of being flooded with total universal knowledge, of being transformed in the instant and bringing that transformation back. To me, it's, it's, it's like the light or spiritual reality or whatever this thing may be called is available all the time. There are just different access routes to it. The psychedelic is clearly one aspect, one, one route that leads to that destination. The near-death experience is another. People find a spiritual path uh, and deeply committed to it could have the same kind of revelation the same kinds of insights so I think that you know it's a question of equal finality many different pathways leading to the same destination and the same transformative effects that's what I think is important about those experiences well now we've had psychedelic experiences and near-death experiences presumably for millennia is this abduction thing new or are we just getting the old stuff repackaged in a funny way? Well, I think that it's related to things that have always happened to humankind. You know, interaction with the invisible world of spirits, your phrase I think was sylphs of the air, right. the elementals, uh, the fairies. Folklore, I think, is certainly related to this particular phenomenon. However, even among folklorists like Eddie Bullard, for example, who's the one who's looked into this most closely from the standpoint of the UFO abduction phenomenon, there seem to be aspects of this experience that uh, make it uh, unique unto itself, make it uh, similar to the folkloric experiences of former times, and yet it's in a kind of technological gloss. I think maybe because the alien is kind of the mythic archetype of our time, it's not fashionable to see angels and spirits and demons anymore, but, you know, the myth of the extraterrestrial is everywhere you look. And so I think in a way, this particular kind of archetype has been clothed in the imagery and the kind of space-age technology and talk and so on that's characteristic of our own time. So I think there's something unique to it and something that relates to, you know, the folkloric experiences of former times, too. Because contact between the invisible world and the physical world that's probably as old as man is old. But you're, essentially, it sounds as though you're fundamentally a a psychologist in that you don't take this at face value. No, I don't take these as literal experiences of an incursion into physical space-time reality of little beings from other places that have come to do nasty things to people. I, that, oddly enough, it seems odd to me, seems to be the dominant view of American ufologists. I'm not a ufologist, as you say, I'm a psychologist. In Europe, I think the, the, the interpretation is quite different. I don't take these experiences literal, but I take them as real within an alternate reality, within what uh, Henri Corbin calls an imaginal realm. They're real enough, you know, people... For example, people who have near-death experiences will say things like, this experience was more real to me than you and I sitting here talking about it is real. It's more real than life itself. There is a reality of these experiences, but I think it's a profound mistake to think it's the same thing as space-time, ordinary sensory world reality. So what you're saying is that these are symbolic constructs. Yes, yes. But there's a symbolic aspect to them. And I think the important thing... You know, I think there are two attitudes toward the UFO question. It's a mystery, but there are two types of mysteries. There are mysteries like in detective stories that beg for some kind of solution and you only feel satisfaction when the solution at the end is revealed and all the reasons given. Then there are mysteries that are meant to be explored and meant to, to be savers, yes. True mysteries. And these mysteries beg for exploration, not for explanation, if I can put it that way. And the UFO seems to me, the UFO phenomenon is the second category of mystery. That's why I personally and perhaps temperamentally I'm opposed to the idea of trying to package it as though it were something as simple as other beings, however amazing that would be in itself, other beings coming from other places in the galaxy to invade or to have some contact with human affairs. I think the mystery is likely to be much more profound than that. And uh, another thing, if I may say, that I think hooks together the near-death experience with the UFO uh, experience, whatever its basis may be, is when people come out of these experiences and have worked it through, they come to have a worldview that is very similar to one another and is very similar to what's being talked about all the time at this conference, and that's an ecological worldview. 
the, the heightening of ecological sensitivity, the increase of concern with the welfare of the planet is one thing that unites these two people, even though they have these very disparate experiences. What they say about what they've learned from these experiences, what the meaning of these experiences for them is that the fate of the earth is in our hands and we better wake up to do something about it very quick. So I see these experiences perhaps being orchestrated by I think uh, this is similar to your view, perhaps a planetary mind, an overmind, a mind at large, mm -hmm. uh, which is in some sense the expression of our deepest yearnings and perhaps our deepest fears that are feeding back these kinds of experiences in the form of kind of archetypal experiences, archetypal images, so as to impress people who might not otherwise be impressed to take the kind of action necessary to correct the, the, the direction in which the earth is headed. So it's a kind of confounding it it's, is. Its purpose oh. is to be inexplicable. Exactly. That's exactly how I conclude my book. I say the point of these experiences is to be baffled by them, almost as though they're a kind of a, a koan that we're not meant to solve, but we're meant to kind of chew over until our rational mind cracks and we begin to think in entirely new ways and hopefully act in entirely new ways. So it's a way of keeping us from closure. Exactly. Same it's kind of a, sort of a deconstruction phenomenon, you could even say. The world, it's saying to us, the world is not so simple as exactly. you might choose to suppose. Exactly so.